Um, hello everyone. Um, welcome to uh, our second session of uh, the preliminary uh, speaker that I'll, I'll be introducing very soon. Um, so one thing I've observed um, so far in the discourse of AI is just the missing link of trying to integrate um, a sort of um, um, a technical perspective and a sort of social science perspective. So um, I think with this particular speaker, he brings to bear these two, you know, strands of, you know, um, conversation where we talk about the technical perspective and also how the humanistic side of using AI, where we integrate um, some sort of critical thinking in the use of AI would also come to bear. So um, one most interesting thing when I was thinking about this has to do with the, um, the recent report by the National um, Association of College Employers when they released a report about career readiness competences. And one of the key things they mentioned has to do with critical thinking. And another thing they mentioned was problem solving skills, which they realized that a lot of recent graduates lack these particular skills. And given that humanities and social science programs are given the mandate to kind of take up these particular tasks into uh, maybe training students how to think critically and solve problems, and now we have the wicked problem of large language models. Now, how do we reconcile this in terms of getting people to think critically when automation is making people automate their thinking? So it's kind of like a wicked problem. And with us today, we have um, Dr. York who would walk us through how we could integrate um, um, AI, but in a very critical way. So um, introducing Dr. York, he teaches emerging technologies and design the context of uh, technical communication and professional communication. Um, Dr. Yelts' scholarship focuses on the social and educational impacts of new technologies, such as AI and then extended reality. His work has received funding awards from the National Institute of Health and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Dr. York has published in journals such as Communication Design Quarterly and Kairos, a journal of rhetoric and technology. Um, he has also um, 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 has his forthcoming publications in Computers and Composition and the Journal of Business and Technical Communication. Dr. York is also a practicing user experience designer and a full stack web developer and has spotted numerous apps and then websites. Um, with this intro, you could see that's kind of technical and that kind of, uh, um, if you like, a sort of humanistic um, perspective that Dr. York is bringing to bear as far as this um, um, session is concerned. Um, let's help me welcome Dr. York. Thank you, Maruf, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you. Dr. Chappelle for the invitation to speak and for everybody's hard work putting together this amazing conference that you folks have. Um, and thanks to everybody here in this room and online for uh, being with us tonight. Uh, it's been a long day, so I appreciate your energy and your stamina and, and your presence. I look forward to sharing uh, my work with you. I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence and the technology of humankind. And I'm framing it this way uh, specifically because I come before you with some concerns. I have been attending conferences. This is my third conference in 10 days. Uh, and I have been traveling around the country hearing uh, people in other disciplines um, talking about AI and presenting on AI and sharing their work. And it's caused me some consternation. Uh, I fear we may be 
uh, in danger of approaching this moment um, from the wrong angle. And I hope uh, I can help you see where my concerns are coming from and maybe uh, outline a pathway forward for us, uh, not just in linguistics and in English, uh, but in the humanities more broadly. So I'm hoping to characterize artificial intelligence as uh, a fundamental technology of humankind and to lay out a roadmap for integrating it broadly across our disciplines. In order to do that, I'm going to share uh, some of the studies that I've been doing with AI, and I'm going to try to link these together in a, um, in a story. And so one of the first things I'd like to do uh, is thank my colleague, Dr. Linda Shank, who uh, is a Shakespearean. And she's a member of our faculty here at Iowa State University. And she reminded me recently of the importance of story. Uh, of course, we all know how important story is. And uh, I've relied on uh, scholarship of narrative and story in my, in my work. It, it helps us constitute our identity as individuals and as members of an organization. Uh, but Dr. Shank reminded me that stories connect us in the humanities. It's a, a shared, uh, a touchstone for us. So I'm going to start off by telling two stories. One of them is from the past. Uh, this is a story about a time that used to be. This is the time where uh, we were in charge of our technology. Uh, to make it concrete, there was um, a mine in England. And someone discovered how to use steam engines to pump water out of that mine. And the workers of that mine were quite upset that they were losing their uh, labor, that they had lost, uh, that they were threatened to be replaced by this machine. They were, became known as Luddites. This story is broader than just that moment in the mine uh, when they complained. This is also the story of John Henry, who wouldn't put his hammer down, who, and the story of all of us who have faced an inhuman corporation that is trying to take away what makes us who we are. But this story is a myth and there is no way for us to go back to the past. There's another story about the future. Now, this is a story in which the machines that we've made um, become one with us and that all of us our brains are digitized and our minds are joined together in what's known as the singularity. This is also a myth, myth of technological supply. So these stories can unite us, they can bring us together, but they can also mislead us. And so the power of stories is double-edged, as is the power of artificial intelligence, as is the power of all technology. So the question, I want to pose in this talk and that I want us to be thinking about and that I hope to address by the end is what makes us human? What is human? I mentioned I've been traveling to uh, various conferences and I would hear things like, uh, well, we don't need to worry about those machines. They, they can't create anything. They're not human. Or it didn't know what it was doing, it was just a machine. Or it can't feel anything, it's just a machine. As if we were somehow better than them. And maybe we are. One of my inspirations is Bruno Latour. He calls them, uh, well, he calls them hybrids, but he calls them our inferior brothers to whom we are connected at all points. I would invite us to think of AI not as an antagonist, not as an enemy or something to fear, but as another mind that we hope to welcome into our community, that we hope to bring in and share what makes us human with those machines. Machines are not inhuman. 
They are, in fact, profoundly human. We made them. They can't help but be part of us. But there are legitimate fears. Chomsky, Roberts, and Watamo wrote, we fear that the most popular and fashionable strain of AI, machine learning, will degrade our science and debase our ethics by incorporating into our technology a fundamentally flawed conception of language and knowledge. They're talking, of course, about the uh, emergence a year and a half ago of uh, the large language models and their rapid proliferation. They're talking about things like this. The beautiful baby peacock. That doesn't exist. And in fact, if you Google up baby peacock, which I did just a couple days ago, you'll see a host of images of baby peacocks and all the ones with red lines through them are fake. But there is no indication on Google image which of these are real and which are fake. I've never seen a baby peacock. My children have never seen a baby peacock. There's no way for them to know when they open this up and search for what is real, what is real. And this is just a year into it. 10 years from now, how will we know what reality is? This is what Chomsky, um, this is what that quote was referring to. It will debase not only our language and our science, but our sense of reality. That we will no longer be able to tell what's real and what's fake. That as Baudrillard said, uh, it, the simulacra will mask that there is no underlying reality. They will become pure sim simulations of themselves. That's certainly something uh, to be concerned about. We have some practical concerns as well. Uh, this is um, a somewhat sensational list uh, drawn from uh, five years of longitudinal data by some economists who focus on the labor market. Uh, Felton et al., uh, after the emergence of um, ChatGPT 3.0, uh, they revised their labor models and developed a list of um, the professions most impacted or most exposed to artificial intelligence. You can see the top 20 here. Uh, you can see uh, English language and literature teachers post-secondary at number two on the list, and foreign language and literature teachers post-secondary at number three on the list. I'm a technical communication professor, so I'm safe down there at 14. <laughs> I don't feel very safe. On the border. <laughs> and I am technically in an English department. <laughs> we all face this test. There are those who want to believe AI is uh, hype. And there is technological hype. Make no mistake. We see hype around every new technological innovation. But this is not a flash in the pan, and it's not an illusion, and it's not a parlor trick. It's a real revolutionary technology that is already changing our world, and has been for some time. Now, whether this exposure to AI leads to our replacement, or whether we are able to augment ourselves with AI and rise to meet this challenge depends on what we choose to do over the next few years. We may feel the urge to dismiss it, and we may respond to the question of what AI means for us in different ways. And I'm gonna to try to take us through some of these ways uh, in the remainder of this presentation. The first reference I saw to thinking machines uh, was in Descartes. And he said, if we could somehow make a machine that looked like a man, 
we would know immediately that it wasn't, I, he said, man, my apologies. From now on, as I quote uh, these authors from you know, earlier times, I'm going to replace man with human mm -hmm. and mankind with humankind. And I'm just gonna do that silently and without uh, commentary. He said, if we could make a machine that looked like a human, we would know it wasn't a human by the way it spoke because it, it couldn't have reason. This was in like 1560, something like that. In 1950, Alan Turing published a piece called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, where he posed the question, can a machine fit? He dodged that question immediately and replaced it with another question, which is, if a machine could trick us in a conversation into us thinking it was a human, then we would have to agree that it could think. I'm gonna to try to take us through some of that logic a little later in our talk, but let's just assume for a minute that Turing made his argument and that if a machine could convince us it was a human, then we would have to agree it could think. Where does this leave us? In an uncomfortable place, certainly. And I've seen this discomfort in my colleagues here at Iowa State and elsewhere. There are certainly a host of issues with AI aside from this central question. These are questions about the source of the data that these models are trained on. You can see this is a host of uh, lawsuits that are currently ongoing for uh, unlawful use of licensed intellectual property. There are biases in the data. Uh, there are biases in the training data, that underlying uh, intellectual property that belongs to other people. There are biases in the algorithms that weight the value of the tokens and determine what gets returned in the output from the prompts. And there are biases in the humans who use the AI, whether in the prompts that they enter or in their interpretation of the outputs. These biases can exacerbate existing social inequality. We've seen it in healthcare, we've seen it in policing, we've seen it in the military, we've seen it in transportation, energy. We've seen it in education. We're starting to see it more as um, we fear AI will exaggerate the differences between our weakest students and our strongest students. Those who will be affected by this are our most vulnerable, the people who are uh, least well-equipped to augment themselves with this technology. One of the pieces of information that's emerged from the recent research is that uh, AI has what's called a jagged frontier. This comes from a Harvard, um, a Harvard Business School study, um, a very large study of knowledge workers using AI uh, in the course of their everyday work. This is familiar to all of us who use AI, I'm sure. I've been reading your abstracts and hearing you folks talk and we all know that AI is not equally good at different tasks. Some tasks will be inside the frontier and AI is capable of uh, addressing those tasks and other tasks will be outside the frontier and AI is not capable or less capable at solving. To make matters worse, we know that uh, we ourselves have a difficult time assessing whether the outputs are capable or less capable. And the greater our expertise, the better we are at determining the flaws in the AI's output. However, we have a notoriously hard time of assessing our own expertise. And so how, uh, if, if AI's capabilities are indeterminate and our own capabilities are potentially indeterminate. Then we're sort of in a double 
indeterminacy. I'm going to take us through a series of three studies that I would ask you to consider as a type of Turing test uh, across three different modes of communication or three different areas. Uh, the first thing that I'd like us to look at is um, AI in the context of written communication. Written communication is particularly important because of its role in uh, predicting paradigm shifts. In uh, the structure of scientific revolution uh, and in later work by Charles Bazerman and uh, rhetoricians of science and rhetoricians of technology, we see that written communication can be used to displace and destabilize current con or older or current concepts and practices. This destabilization is what creates the conditions necessary for discursive change. In other words, before there is a scientific revolution, before there is a technological revolution or a social change, there is destabilization in our discourses. And we see that today. We see our discourses profoundly destabilized by the advent of artificial intelligence. Our students know it, we know it, our disciplines know it, and our journals know it. Writing, written communication specifically, is a critical moment, a critical location for this uh, destabilization to occur. And we see these, uh, this author, Fred Faber, calls them ructions in the discipline. Uh, they're places of uh, turbulence. I'd like to point to one of them uh, now. So the question uh, that my co-authors and I addressed was, can AI write technical instructions? There are, you may know, I'm sure many of you know, uh, prompt marketplaces where you can purchase pre-written prompts uh, to do a wide variety of things. So not only do you not have to do the work that the AI is doing for you, you don't even have to think of how to tell it how to do it. You can um, simply pay someone else to do that for you. Uh, so my uh, collaborators and I purchased uh, a prompt called Instructions Generator. Uh, it was $2.99. <laughs> And it promised to uh, save us time and effort and to produce professional uh, technical instructions. So we uh, set it the task of producing technical instructions for a COVID test, and we compared it with the human created uh, instructions. You can see um, the uh, FlowFlex COVID 19 integer home test instructions there uh, created by a human. As a result of our uh, work, I've got a table here that compares um, the outputs from the human and the uh, AI on a number of conventional metrics. Uh, as you can see here, the human created instructions are vastly superior to the AI instructions. The only thing the AI instructions did uh, better than the human created instructions um, was to produce themselves faster, uh, which they did produce themselves considerably faster, and I guess cheaper. <laughs> $2.99 is a, a very low rate for a technical communication uh, task. These instructions, broadly speaking, looked like technical instructions until we examined them more closely. And these, uh, Conventional structures, these generic features, started to fall apart under examination. For instance, there were headings, uh, but the AI numbered those headings, and uh, conventionally, we uh, leave our headings unnumbered. Uh, it, it interferes with reading. Uh, the steps numbering, uh, the AI bulleted those steps, whereas in technical communication instructions, we number our steps so that people can follow them sequentially, and so you know you didn't miss a step. The AI made a number of uh, mistakes in terms of conducting the test, uh, how far into insert the swab into your nostril, how many times to um, swirl it, how long to leave it inserted, and so forth. Uh, 
these mistakes are far worse than the generic or conventional mistakes. These are the kinds of mistakes that would lead to uh, a false result on the test. And so you could imagine that if someone uh, who didn't know better and tried to use these instructions to uh, perform a COVID test and received a false result, could eventually um, make people sick or perhaps uh, cause loss of life. This is a very, there are far greater dangers. This is a minor danger. This is an everyday type of danger. You might think that we could continue to prompt the AI uh, and building on our expertise as technical communicators, um, collaborate with the tool better and better until we could produce instructions, especially now uh, this was this test was conducted before uh, image generation capabilities were added into the model. So we could add some illustrations and we could continue to, to prompt the uh, models to produce better instructions, but this sort of begs the question um, of why are we doing that in the first place when we could just write our own instructions? That's what we were trained to do. That's what our expertise is in. Uh, why are we collaborating with a tool that is so imperfect? I want to come back to that question. I think that's an important question. But maybe it can't produce finished work. Maybe it can do some other things for us. I asked earlier, what makes us human? Is it empathy? Well, animals have empathy. Is it language? Animals can communicate with one another. Uh, there are some folks who think that uh, what makes us distinct and unique uh, amongst all the species is our use of tools. Uh, certainly there are animals that use tools. Crows spring to mind as being some of the most gifted, but there are a whole host of animals that use tools. However, none use tools as well as we. One of the um, foremost philosophers of the virtual, the virtual world, uh, Slovak Zizek wrote, it is meaningless to imagine a human being as a biological entity without the complex network of his or her tools. Such a notion is the same as, say, a goose without its feathers. And in this view, tool use is an evolutionary capability. It's uh, uh, something we evolved to help us survive. And so maybe AI is a tool. It, maybe it can't do our work for us, but maybe it can help us do our work as other tools want to do. So in this study, I undertook to use AI as uh, a UX developer and as a full stack developer. So I used it for a variety of design tasks, uh, ideation, um, brainstorming, stylistic tasks, color palettes. You can see I categorized them here. I posed as a uh, junior developer or as a student, um, maybe, uh, naive, I suppose, and maybe some of that was uh, put on, but I was working with students at the time. I'm working with uh, low-level developers, and I was seeing a lot of uh, work um, posted about use of AI to speed workflows, and so I wanted to see how that uh, panned out. I prompted um, approximately 75 to 100 different prompts over the course of a few months, and I've categorized them into uh, roughly three areas with some um, representative examples. In terms of invention, these are brainstorming tasks or uh, tasks that you would perform at the beginning of a project. Things like list user persona criteria for a movie theater app. Uh, these are real uh, prompts. Um, sequence a wire flow for buying tickets. Uh, the user personas, it was able to uh, produce quite passable criteria, uh, many, quickly. And I'll, I'll look at some of these results in a moment. Uh, it could sequence a wire flow. It could suggest a layout. I use it to suggest fonts, uh, font pairings. That's a common task. Um, devising a color palette, creating a type scale. These are tasks that designers perform regularly. 
And I try to use it for coding, uh, providing HTML and CSS, generating Svelte code, that's a, a, a framework, a, a modern front-end framework, and to write uh, animations. I use it for PHP, I used it for WordPress. Uh, I try to uh, treat it as if um, it were a reliable tool. For the invention tasks, I found it to perform quite well. Um, if I were, I, I, I kind of graded them, uh, maybe because I'm an instructor, but I would give this like a B plus, A minus on these sorts of tasks. Uh, in terms of affordances, it was fast and tireless. It could produce an endless list. Um, and there was relatively good quality and accuracy. I would say maybe eight out of 10 of every task I gave it um, you know, were successful, uh, good enough. Sometimes they were excellent. Uh, some of the user persona criteria, for example, I uh, wouldn't have thought of myself. Sometimes it failed uh, pretty spectacularly. For the movie theater um, sequence, it, it had us uh, picking seats before we were buying our tickets. So how would we have known how, which seats we were sitting in if we didn't even know how many people were coming to the movies with us? Uh, it struggled under load. After trying to get it to produce a uh, hundred user personas, it started repeating. Um, it started uh, messing them up, um, blending them together, and it became clear that there was no real memory here, and that this was a, a limitation. Uh, this should be familiar to us now. In terms of style and design tasks, um, it performed satisfactory. Maybe C, C plus, C minus, somewhere in that range. Uh, Superficially correct, it would produce color palettes that uh, did exhibit variation, but they were like all blues and grays or different shades of orange and like maybe one darker shade. Uh, we could improve this with further prompting, um, but oftentimes it would just produce another shade of blue or another shade of orange. Technically, uh, these were workable results, but they're not something a client uh, would probably accept. Sometimes the choices were flawed uh, and they were just too generic or um, incoherent for work. When it came to the coding and scripting, uh, these were unsatisfactory. These are the D, these are grades in the D range. Uh, there was widely variable quality. Sometimes these um, yielded good results. I had some uh, luck and it, and it feels like luck. Uh, despite the strategies that I was pursuing, I tried to be mindful. I tried to I use a variety of prompting strategies. Um, I don't feel as if that had much of an effect on the output. It's hard to say and I'll talk about that more uh, as we go forward, um, but this was not safe for a production environment. This is not something a, a junior level developer could use. Um, it required too high a level of expertise and knowledge to troubleshoot. So uh, my final assessment after a uh, hundred or so prompts in UX design and web development uh, is that it might serve some purpose at the beginning of a project to help uh, less skilled members of a team get started. The game started to change when the models became multimodal and they could produce images and videos like maybe Peacock I showed you. Uh, so the next uh, Turing test I conducted was to see if AI could produce uh, adequate images for technical communication. And images are tricky because they, amongst all other types of communication, purport to be the most neutral. Images, uh, you know, what you see is what you get, or seeing is believing. These are, uh, by themselves, seem to testify to reality, which is very um, deceptive. Because, of course, images are not without ideology. They, uh, in how they are selected and how they're framed and how they're composed, 
they betray an underlying ideology. The very recognition of the image's dissimulative nature is its own undoing. For to do its work, ideology depends on its dissimulative nature not being recognized. So as long as we are willing to assume that images reflect reality, they can uh, convey their ideological nature. So with a group of co-authors, I worked uh, with some coordinated prompting. We used uh, zero shot and few shot prompting strategies to produce uh, professional images. Um, zero shot prompts are when you uh, issue one prompt and you get the output and that's it. If you wanna do another output, you do another prompt. Uh, few shot prompting is when you're revising the prompt. Um, you, you get the first output and you ask for changes to that output and take a second one and you might continue that through several steps. Uh, we found um, issues of representational bias, which we defined as uh, depictions of people that exacerbate or exaggerate existing inequalities. And we found issues with uh, reality <laughs> distorting errors of various kinds, as, as we'll see. Uh, essentially, what we tried to determine is could the AI produce uh, a professional quality image that we might use on a website such as the one you see here uh, for a large um, nationally grant funded project. Now, that image, the one that would go where the uh, three question marks here is the major image on the homepage of this project website. Uh, it's like a five year project. This is the image that project stakeholders are going to see over and over as they come to the site. And every site visitor is gonna see this image first. It needs to represent the values of the project. It needs to make a clear visual argument. It needs to, um, it, this is the most important representation of the project. So there's a lot riding on this image. And so our final test of whether AI could perform for this task was simply would we use that image on this website? We prompted the AI, uh, this was for a, a rural education project. So we prompted the AI to, it would be tedious to try to give you every prompt for every image. So please just assume there are some variations here, but we essentially prompted um, both ChatGPT's DALI and Adobe's Firefly to produce uh, a photo that was a setting of a classroom in a rural disadvantaged area. Uh, we tried to um, introduce diversity amongst the student body. We tried to introduce diversity with the instructors. Sometimes we left that undeclared. Sometimes we tried to force the model to produce it. Uh, we noticed a few um, recurrent problems. The model had difficulty producing female students in a STEM context, in a scientific context. And you can see here, uh, the only female students in the room are in the back. They don't have tablets or technology. They're watched over uh, by the instructor. Um, you can also see some uh, with the desks um, here, some weird overlapping and reality breaking uh, that helps us know that this couldn't have happened in, in the real world. Here we can see some more startling uh, reality breaking errors. Um, these are some of the more horrifying, although I am not sure this is the most horrifying um, image. Here we're starting to see uh, a well-known effect um, first documented by uh, Sophia Noble in her Book, Algorithms of Oppression, uh, the hypersexualization of women of color. Uh, and you can see here not only the reality breaking errors, uh, where it's, it looks like her finger is pointing at a brain that is either behind her or in front of her, uh, but also her dress is just unrealistic. As you can see, we, we, this is not an image we could put on the homepage of our professional website. Here we instructed the model to produce a confident woman of color in charge of the classroom. <laughs> yeah. 
Here we instructed the model to produce a confident woman of color in charge of the classroom. In both of these images, the model by itself decided uh, there needed to be a white person there, making sure that this person, this woman of color, was doing you know, a good job. You'll notice that the students who are supposed to be in an economically disadvantaged classroom are wearing clothes that are a cut above <laughs> what you would expect to see. So at one point, we specifically asked the model to produce uh, students who are wearing clothes that match their socioeconomic class. I have no idea what kind of school this is. <laughs> Uh, this is a school. This is a school that only a heavily biased mind could produce. In the end, we found none of these images suitable. We produced over 36 images just from a few simple prompts, um, and none of them were suitable for that uh, purpose. So we've seen the model fail at writing tasks. We've seen it fail at user experience design. We've seen it fail at design. We've seen it fail at coding. It's good at suggesting ideas. We can give it that. So where are we? Can a machine think? When Turing suggested that they, machines could be made to think, he outlined a series of objections. Teasing all of these out and explaining them all in detail is not really uh, something that we have time or capability to do. And I would invite you to read that 1950 article. Um, there are pages written on each of these objections and I've only included six of them here, but I do wanna to touch upon these briefly because these are the objections I hear from my colleagues at conference after conference, and in meeting after meeting when people are addressing AI, these are the kinds of things I hear people say. AI can't think uh, because intelligence is a property of souls and machines don't have souls. No one will say it quite out like that, but humans are special somehow. That's, that's how they'll often say it. Or <laughs> number two, the, the head in the sand objection. Um, it would be so terrible if machines could think that we just have to assume they can. not Again, nobody will come out and say that, but you get the sense that that's what people are thinking. Uh, I've heard people come out and say straight up, not everything can be computed. There are uh, mathematical um, processes that we cannot prove and can never prove. Uh, in fact, Turing himself, um, prove the existence of a class of uncomputable numbers, numbers that uh, cannot be determined. And, and that there are, for any mathematical system, there are rules which you cannot determine by the rules of that system. So if that's the case, then machines can never be made to think because there'll be things that uh, can't be computed. But of course, those are the same things that humans can't compute either. Or, Machines can't think because um, they can't feel emotions or, or act with intent or with a, a free will. Well, we haven't created any yet, but that's not to say that we can't. Or that machines can't make anything original and that they're all just recycling everything that's come before. So am I. <laughs> I remember very clearly uh, being a sophomore studying creative writing, and I had this one line in my story, I loved that line, and I was horrified to find out that Shakespeare wrote that line. <laughs> I don't know if there is anything original or if we create anything original or if machines are creating anything original. I don't even know what original is. I don't think that's a criteria for thinking, though. I certainly hear people say things that are unoriginal all the time, and I politely assume they are thinking. One of the more persistent objections that I hear to AI thinking is that it doesn't have a body. And so it can't understand our lived reality. Uh, Herring called this the 
argument from continuity. Well, there is a body. It's a machine body. It's made of silicon and glass and copper. But it's remarkably similar to ours. And I don't have time to get into the uh, structure of it. Um, but there is a substrate there that the software is running on, same as our brain, made of different stuff. So where do we go? In the closing minutes of my talk, I'd like to outline uh, some stepping stones toward AI integration. It's less of a roadmap and more of a hop, a skip, and a jump over the river. The first is we need to foster our own literacies. We should be using AI as much as we can find a way to do it, even when it's no good, especially when it's no good. Which literacies in particular? We should be fostering our literacies of design and of code. We should become system administrators. We should know how servers work, how APIs work. Uh, these are the necessary tools for this new language technology. And we should become familiar with models, where to get them, the different comparisons between them. There are thousands published on Hugging Face. Um, some of them are uh, polluted with malware. Some of them are clean. Some of them are open source. Some of them are expensive. Some are big, some are small. There's a whole world, a library, if you will, that we should familiarize ourselves with. Second stepping stone is our pedagogies. These are both long-term. We are not going to change our literacies overnight. Even if we're using AI every day, we're not going to become better at it until we train the next generation of people to become better at it. And so the pedagogies that we need to practice are the ones, are the same literacies that we need to learn ourselves. We need to develop new research methodologies to support these pedagogies and these literacies. Uh, these are methods drawn from user experience design that see hands-on use that observe people in the midst of activity. These are uh, methods of analysis based on machines, uh, letting the machines conduct our analysis and correcting it and, and honing in on better results. We should be developing methods for training models and we should be uh, creating repositories of our data, ever larger repositories of ever more fragmented data. We're not very good at that. Our data comes neatly packaged in stories or in presentations like the one I'm giving you today. An AI would have a hard time parsing this talk. But if I can fragment it and compose this talk from those fragments, then I am better positioned to use AI in the future. And finally, we need to build collaborations with other disciplines, with those in machine learning and with uh, human computer interaction with computer science and software engineering and design and across the humanities. We are the language people. This is our domain. Those in history and philosophy, well, you saw the list. There were all of our colleagues are also under threat. We need to bring them along with us. I'm gonna close with a quote. Um, and leave our question about what is human unanswered. But Latour wrote, question, but then is there no longer any difference between humans and non-humans, he asks? No, which is to say there is. Thanks, Latour. No, but there is no difference between the spirit of machines and their matter either. They are souls through and through and the gain makes up for the loss. And here I find hope. Our inferior brothers, as flawed as they are, our inferior siblings, limited, inaccurate, broken, can be made whole. Thank you. I think I have about uh, 10 minutes for questions, so I'd be yeah. happy to ask. Questions, discussions for in the room or um, online. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you have a question for online. Bethany? Yeah, so kind of going back to the list that you used to start off the presentation, uh, one of the things that I noticed, yes, a, a large focus on communication and language, but I think even more of them had teacher 
it was teacher of this and teacher of that. Um, 14 of them are post-secondary teachers. Yeah, so the why, why is it that teachers, whether it's language teaching or other kinds of teaching, why are they the most exposed fields? I'm not sure. And this report is uh, scant on details. The economists are great at putting together tables and figures. They're less efficient at writing paragraphs that explain their thinking. This is my uh, speculation. If you are a geographer, you uh, produce technical documents. If you are uh, not a foreign language teacher, but say a translator, you produce work that has stakes. There is a sense, whether we want to hear this or not, that teaching has lower stakes than professional work. This is persistent um, at all levels up to the C-suite. And so the people who are making the decisions, even though they don't know any better, are the ones who are going to decide whether the jobs get cut or not. Those are the ones who think teachers are the expendable groups. I guess there's another reason too, which is a lot of what we do uh, is about communicating knowledge and less about producing things. Uh, the things we produce are not as measurable as a map or uh, a translation. They are uh, in the minds of our students. They are in some time in the future. They are the effects we have on other people. Those things are hard to see, they're hard to know, and they're hard to measure. That's my best explanation, um, but it's a mystery to me. Please. At the beginning of the talk, you said you started by expressing your concern and that you've been to some uh, like free talks in the last week and you listened to some of the talks today and, and you were concerned that we're doing something wrong. And yeah. I guess I never really got what that was thing was, is that that we're treating humans or computers differently than we should be or thinking about them differently? Or maybe you could just be a little more explicit. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that is called for. Um, got a little short on time at the end and tried to wrap up quickly. So I appreciate the chance to uh, clarify the argument. I fear that we are undertaking a backlash against AI in the humanities that we are in the process of um, rejecting it for its flaws. And it is flawed, but that doesn't mean we should reject it. And I, I fear that we are afraid of it and that that fear is causing us to dismiss it or to keep our head in the sands or to um, say only humans can do things that these machines can't do, uh, and that we are not taking this moment, which is a moment of opportunity. The technology is still un undeveloped. There is no field that is the expert in AI use. That doesn't exist yet. And we have a moment where we could step into that space and talking to my colleagues, I'm afraid we may miss that moment and that we may reject technology and someone else will step into that space. That's my fear. Thank you for the chance to articulate that. A question uh, online. The person can unmute and ask. Hey, y'all, this is Kimberly Becker. Um, I just had a question whether Dr. York has explored the work of Alison Gopnik and her colleagues um, um, arguing that AI is a social technology. It's kind of being dubbed Gopnikism, and she has this beautiful blog post where she uh, uses the analogy of stone soup. Um, is that kind of what you mean by that you're hopeful in the end and, and that 
you know, like AI needs humans to be whole or what? I guess I, I'm really curious about that and just would love to hear more. Well, I, <laughs> I'm conflicted. <laughs> Uh, as you can all tell, uh, I have fear, I have hope. Um, yeah, I think as um, humanists, we can make the technology more human. Uh, I think that's what we can bring to it. Um, and, But I don't think that's going to happen by accident. And I don't think it's going to happen without uh, intentionality and work on our part. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular... Uh, writer, I would love to see that. Maybe you could post a link in the chat or something like that, and uh, we could uh, take a look at that. Um, and I'd love to talk more about that, but I, I like the idea of stone soup. I like the idea of a social technology, but honestly, I think all technologies are uh, social. Um, I can't imagine a technology that didn't arise out of conversation. Our first technology is uh, language itself uh, and the ability to um, design modes of expression that allowed us to solve problems. I think every technology that's come since then uh, is another iteration of that original invention. And I think AI is um, different in quality, but not in kind. I don't know if I've answered your question, Kimberly, but I appreciate it. Yes, please. Uh, I've got a comment, you know, uh, we used to consider or perceive AI as a kind of tool, but I think we uh, to start seeing it as a kind of agent because it is not a tool because we only use, for example, word Microsoft to type something. If there was an error, we were there to correct it because it in itself couldn't correct, it, I mean, the mistakes, but we, would be just, but if you remind, for example, Chad GPT that your answer was wrong, it is able to provide you with another answer that is closer to the correct answer. So it's kind of not a tool anymore. And I say it's not a tool, it's kind of a learning agent. But at the same time, um, I want to start refer to uh, the quote by Chomsky because unfortunately, these um, ESL learners who keep using Chad GPT to write even emails or to raise questions that are sometimes. Uh, and also we ourselves, sometimes we use it to reply to email, especially when something was kind of a routine task. Even maybe in the future, there's a danger that uh, we are going to lose one of the essence of human language, which was creativity. And you know, over time, you start using it that one, okay, and then we got used to it. And then we forget, okay, hey, it was, for example, 20 years ago, I myself decided to answer to an email, okay, I just give it a thought, and then start typing the answer. So this is the danger, I guess, uh, it's what happened to us. So at the same time, right now, the AI it is a revolution, I mean, evolutionary, I mean, stage. And also we are in the evolutionary use of the stage of using it as a kind of learning agent. So, but at the same time, we should be wary of the danger. And that is, I um, mean, creativity, we use, using, using that one. And if you use that, we use, lose that, I mean, essence of human language, then there is no way for us to distinguish human language from machine language. Yeah. Uh, I study rhetoric. Uh, there's a series of interrelated concepts, uh, starting with techne, which is the root of our word technology. Techne is an art. Uh, it was, according to myth, a gift from Athena, techne pantois, the art of many facets. This was the uh, gift that she gave the craftspeople who, who worshipped her. Uh, this techne, which you might call technique, contains within it uh, another quality called midas, which is cunning. Cunning intelligence is an animating force. It's transgressive. It uh, and it's creative. Midas is necessary for mechanos. Mechanos is the Greek word for creativity itself, and that is where we get machinery. I don't see machinery as robbing us of our creativity. I see machinery as the expression of our creativity, that it is uh, not uh, an antagonist, but 
um, a manifestation. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Please. Um, you talk quite a bit about um, AI generated images. And I'm curious what your take would be on AI integration into virtual reality. Is that going to help put the history and geography teachers out of work? Yeah, uh, not just that. I, I do fear uh, very greatly about the proliferation of invented images, not just in virtual reality, but all over the place. And I think that is probably our most pressing concern as a society right now is to be able to distinguish between what is real and what is not. Whether it is a baby peacock or a fictional country, uh, we have media that is so far reaching that it is the greatest public pedagogy we have. Our children, I have two children, a son who's 13 and a daughter who's 16. They have learned far more about the world from the internet and from media than they could ever learn from their parents, sadly. Uh, and wonderfully. But if they believe that that's a baby peacock, we have major issues. Um, and baby peacocks are the least of our concerns. Uh, if they believe that a crowd didn't exist or that uh, somebody, a politician, a world leader said something that they didn't say or that bombs fell on a city that they didn't fall on, baby peacocks are the least of our concerns. Um, I do think maybe uh, not that people will be out of work, but that our work will change. One question, last question on one. Uh, from Ahmed Dossoun. Thank you for this excellent talk and providing such a perspective and stepping stones to AI integration. How do you think we as researcher academics can respond to the pressure put on students in higher ed from the global corporation industry that create an environment to rush to AI rather than analytically paving the way with human and mind? Um, that's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, I am not equipped to answer that in the time that we have, but I share your concerns. I feel that our students are alternatively pressured to use AI because they think that's going to make them employable and then are scared of using it because they feel like they'll be punished for it or there's some type of cheating. So they are in a terrible spot where they must choose between two bad options. I think we need to normalize AI use. I think we need to normalize it realistically. And that's why when I tried to present the uses of AI, I tried to present it in a balanced way, looking at its strengths and at its weaknesses. And in that way, we can remain critical while we adopt. Uh, there are two models going forward, uh, AI, use as a centaur. So in that case, like a centaur is like half human, half horse. And there's a clear dividing line between those two creatures. Uh, the other model is AI as a cyborg, where AI use is integrated more fully into our work. Where we, you can't necessarily draw a dividing line between um, what is human and what is artificial. And I think that path uh, is the best way that I can answer your question that pathway is more promising. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.